So welcome back for the second talk of the evening. The next speaker is Antonio Cavedoni. Antonio is a type designer from Sassuolo, a city in the north of Italy. Uh, after a master's degree in type design at the University of Reading, he moved to California to work for Apple, where he led the uh, team that designed the typeface San Francisco. That is the sun safe that we are used to see and read every day on our iPhones and our MacBooks. In 2016, he moved back to Italy to start his own practice. And one year later, he curated an exhibition about uh, Francesco Simoncini, a really good and important Italian type designer for the, of the 20th century. So the word new is kind of hard to use in the 21st century because lots of things have already been made and most of the typefaces that have been released in the last years are um, reinterpretation or smart copies more or less successful of something that is already here. But what makes uh, Antonio's work really unique and special is uh, that he is expressing himself, his ideas, his vision, no matter if uh, it's right or wrong, if it's beautiful, <laughs> if it's beautiful <laughs> or ugly. He's just pursuing his passion uh, without caring about trends and uh, uh, what they say or what they predict. And uh, all of us should take him as an example in our daily work. So in 2018, he started his new adventure in type design, his new foundry called Fonderia Cavedoni. And today he's gonna show some insights on the work that uh, he did the last uh, year. So I'm really, somewhat might say Italians do it better. <laughs> I'm not sure is it true, I don't truly believe it, but I know that uh, Antonio's work is at a really high level. So. I'm really proud to introduce you, Antonio Cavedoni. Thank you, Ruggiero. Wow. Good evening, folks. I'm not going to try to speak French, because I can't. Um, my name is Antonio Cavedoni, and I am absolutely thrilled to be here in Paris to talk to you about micro adjustments and beyond. Uh, Jean-Francois, thank you. Thank you, Mathieu. Thank you, everybody, uh, all the students in Type Paris, for having me here. So uh, I figured I'd do something a little different than a straight portfolio talk. Uh, so let me give you a, an introduction, um, talk about adjustments, and then I'll give you a little preview of my fonderia, like uh, Ruggiero was saying, and then we'll move on to Q&A. And the introduction is going to be short. So this is the relative sizes of what I'm talking about, <laughs> <laughs> I'm hoping. So ready? All right. So first off, a little bit about me. I started my career working as a web designer and developer. And so despite working on letters uh, for any environment now, or at least claiming to, the screen is really my uh, first home. During my involvement with the web, I developed an interest and eventually a bit of freak expertise on a relatively narrow field of type design, which is functional typefaces and typefaces drawn for the smallest possible sizes and the most hostile environments. Signage faces, faces for print on crappy newsprint, faces for yellow pages and reference books, etc. Now, before I go any further, in general, we have many giants uh, upon whose shoulders we stand on in type design. But if you two are interested in this field, these people, amongst many others, have done some really interesting work in this space. And lists like these uh, tend to upset those in know or who feel are they are wrongly left out, but hear me out. I mean, I get it. But this is just a starter list I made for the Type Paris students here. If there are names you don't recognize in here, uh, I do recommend spending time to check out their work. And of course, I must mention other more recent landmark designs in this space, like Meta by Eger Spiekerman, <coughs> Retina by Tobias Fred Jones, and one of the most important ones to me personally, the now ubiquitous, but for the longest time unsung, Freight by Josh Darden. This too, obviously, is not um, a comprehensive list. There are so many more interesting designs in this space and designers. And speaking about landmarks, and not in the metaphorical sense, I think we should at least mention Parisine by our own very host here, Jean-Francois Porchez. 
No, he did not pay me for this advertorio. I apologize for the poor quality because I took this picture the other day where I was running to try to get to the metro. So which fun one of the two feels the most Paris to you? The top or the bottom? I mean, yeah, of course. I like that the Italian note at the bottom uh, is in italics, which is very appropriate. But also that the botched Helvetica at the top is slightly tracked out. I mean, there's some sense to this monstrosity. But seriously, I first saw Parisine when I was 18 years old. I was visiting to attend the World Youth Day in Paris in 1997. Sorry. It was one of the hottest summits I have ever experienced, apart from this one. We came from Italy on a deadly overnight 13-hour bus ride. And the people from Paris didn't like us. Uh, two million of us flooding the city. So I was told that some of us were thrown rocks from people's balconies. Myself, I had an enjoyable, injuries-free week hosted by a lovely family uh, not far from saint Sulpice, and I remember being fascinated by the tiny letters on the metro. So when I started at Reading, I designed an experimental top-heavy design by the name of Enquire, ser Serif and Sans, which was meant for the web, a design that proved a tremendous learning experience for me. I hadn't quite yet developed a methodology for verifying the, exper the experiments I was making, and so Enquire ended up remaining an idea a bit of funny and kind of hard to use type design. But it did, I think, pioneer a minor wave of reverse stress and top heavy serif designs amongst students, which is a dubious claim, I know, but hear me out. Later on, after a stint as an intern and type engineer, I eventually was on the team who designed the San Francisco fonts at Apple. It has been the absolute privilege of my career so far, my most important professional experience. First, we designed it for uh, the Apple Watch, where the small size considerations were, of course, paramount. And later on for iOS, macOS, and eventually for Apple Maps, Apple's own branding, the campus signage, et cetera, et cetera. We also exposed it to web browser via the, sorry, dash dash Apple dash system CSS property. And so it became the typeface used by site, sites like Twitter, Facebook, GitHub, and many, many more. Now, despite it being my first formal release, and so technically being completely inexperienced for the job, for better or for worse, hundreds of millions of people ended up reading tiny letters that my teammates and I ended up designing. What a blast. But Apple, amongst other things, also provided me the feedback loop that I was sorely missing in school. We could draw something and immediately see in uh, use and evaluate it in context with thousands of users testing it out right away. After I left Apple in 2016, I was also fortunate to play a very small part in bringing to life Josh Darden's grotesque successor to Freight by the name of Halyard. By the time I got involved, the design was more or less settled, and so its merits lay entirely with Eben Sorkin, Lucas Sharp, and Josh Darden, of course. But still, I became more than a little familiar with it. And lastly, though I cannot claim mastery by any stretch of the imagination, I have been doing some explorations in the world of letter cutting in stone and wood. While just loosely related to the world of type, these experiences have helped and still help, um, still keep helping me immensely in thinking about size, uh, because the drawing and the final reproduc reproduction all happen at a one-to-one -one scale from one another. Um, as I wrote to Gina uh, in their interview for the Type Paris site. Where's Gina? There you go. Thank you. So <laughs> as one learns about how the tools work, one also learns how to either make the tools do their thing or conceal their traces when possible and necessary. So all of these, amongst other projects, I do believe all give me, if not authoritativeness, they at least give me an insignificant amount of theoretical and practical experience to qualify me speaking to you about <laughs> designing for various sizes and environments. What I will present today are just my own opinion, of course, but I like to think they are somewhat informed to a certain extent. And consequently, consequently I have developed a key interest and some experience on the subject of micro-adjustments, I use the term as a broad umbrella under which I kind of like to study everything that happens between the designer thinking an idea and an actual um, glyph that gets read by someone. These adjustments are micro both in the sense that they affect small size type, but also that they are very, very fine, they're minute. Some designers of the past have either considered these corrections as implementation details, have delegated them to engineers, or have even patronized them for their lack of artistic skills building a barrier between disciplines. And conversely, the engineers have patronized designers because of their lack of touch with the reality of engineering matters. Now, these unfortunate divisions are still with us today. 
and I believe that they are all ultimately rooted in fear. People want to shelter themselves by waving the reasonable sounding flags of professionalism, specialization, division of labor, and personally, I think these barriers are just superficial. I believe that only through dialogue, diversity, communication, intermingling, and awareness can good results truly be achieved. From what I understand, the early punch cutters, calligraphers, painters, writers, letter cutters, and designers who invented the shapes that we take for granted today didn't enforce these divisions, and neither should we. Okay, so let's talk about micro-adjustments. Let's start from overshoots, which are the most basic of adjustments. The Romans already knew about them. Here's a picture of a portion of a rubbing of the Trajan column by done by Father Kadich, Edward Kadich, and now held at the public library in San Francisco. The apex of the triangular shape, like the A, has to extend the flat letters, and so do the round ones. Right? We blow it up. I have some guidelines. I don't know if you can see them. The round shape extends beyond the square ones, right? If they didn't, and everything aligned on the same guidelines, the triangle and the circle will look small. Now, I used a similar example of overshoots in a talk I did a few years back about San Francisco, and it's a concept that we in this room probably take for granted um, in our field, but regular people were blown away by it uh, when I showed it. Now, back to the Roman letters for a sec. You can imagine how these overshoot adju adjustments also happen within a single letter. If you have acute angle terminals next to a flat terminal, you must make the pointy ones stick out by a little bit. Okay, so it's time for a little quiz, and it's the worst quiz ever because I already told you the answer just now. Ready? You tell me, which one do you think is more balanced? This one or this one? I'm gonna go back and forth. Don't tell me the answer, like ho hold it for a second. <laughs> that, that doesn't work. Okay, how about now, Jean-Francois? Is this better or is this better? Mm, now we're getting somewhere. Okay, I can tell you. Do you want to tell me the answer? <laughs> Is it A or B? <laughs> so there's... Okay. All right. So when my eyes see this, really small, they're like, okay. But when they see this, they think, oh no, I think it's doing this. Oh my God. But here's how I go about these optical situations, if you will. First, I'll make something, and usually I'll draw it geometrically, like with everything on the same measurements, everything aligning up. Then I usually leave it be. I like to print stuff and have it hanging on the wall, so I'll see it even when I'm not seeing with the corner of my eye. Sometimes I notice something that is not quite supposed how it's supposed to be. And this part sounds easy to say, but actually it, it sounds harder to do than it is in practice. It just takes some practice. Usually it starts with the feeling of imbalance, and then it develops. <laughs> so you're like <laughs> scouting for imbalance. Now the next part is more interesting, which is if you can't describe what you think your eyes are seeing and draw it in an exaggerated fashion, all of a sudden you can actually start validating your perception with other people. Hey, every time I see this shape, Sharia, it looks like it's doing this. What do you think? The adjustment then presents itself in a rather obvious way. What we need to do is go the other direction, but not enough that it will be noticeable or you know, jarring, of course. Or perhaps the whole idea gets rejected and the original uncorrected shape with its subtle um, effect in the environment where it was supposed to be used was exactly what was meant from the beginning. I just want people to be aware, aware of these kind of corrections and how much you need to do them. By now, it's probably clear that overshoot adjustments are size specific. Adjustments made for one size tend to be inadequate or overkill for another size. Depending on the design, that might mean that you need to correct less for a large size or more for smaller sizes, vice versa. Now, if you're at all interested in this kind of stuff, I highly recommend you buy a copy of uh, Tim Ahrens and Shoko Mujikura's book, Size-Specific uh, Adjustments to Type Designs. Just make absolutely sure you get the second edition, which is the one on the right. Not only is it better designed, but the paper and print quality are excellent, unlike the first one, unfortunately. And the contents have also been updated and revised. I'll, I'll have a bibliographic slide at the end, so you don't have to take a picture of this. But, hey. That being said, some adjustments like overshoots are also shape specific. Now it's intuitive that the triangle needs a different amount of overshoot from the square than the circle to look even, right? What's less intuitive is that even the same kinds of shapes, in this case two rounds, sometimes need different overshoots. This is SF, 
And actually, we noticed that the D was doing something, but it's, uh, if it was overshooting by this amount of the O, it would look actually taller. You couldn't see, the, see it big, but you could see it in smaller sizes. And so we corrected it. Can you see it? It's a very, very subtle adjustment. Uh, very, very subtle. And I'm not even sure why it works, to be honest with you. Perhaps it has to do with the different pointiness of the shapes. Um, if you allow me the term, basically like the fact that the overall, um, the D uh, curve is slightly narrower and thus steeper, has a steeper curve. You tell me. Now let's talk about weight for a second. We saw a point er, uh, N in the example earlier. Now imagine a flat angle M. It could have weight issues at the junctions, right, where I highlighted it. Now, there's a bit of a strange book from 1972, which is titled The Modification of Letter Forms by Stanley Hess. It has no bibliography, and it is a bit of a puzzle. I found it uh, through Shoko and Tim's book that I was mentioning earlier. From what I can tell, this book uh, mostly describes a system of proportions for drawing a modular shape superfamily, not unlike Univer. But it does have an interesting illustration of solutions for unwanted density. Hess uses a capital M as an example. And here I've numbered his solutions to make uh, uh, them easier to read. Hess says that they're, uh, they're presented in the order of invention. So I'll go through them uh, in a second. Now in number seven, he calls ink traps lacuna and writes that it's the form which he thinks has the widest currency in 1972. I'm not really sure how number eight substitution, number nine rounded terminals, or number 11 surface disturbance are of any help, to be honest. But as wacky as it looks, number 12 redesign is actually kind of intriguing. Now look at number one, an increased angle of incidence, which is actually Gil Sands, which Hess writes has fallen into undeserved neglect. And number five, which is called thin interior strokes. We actually use uh, something not too far from a combination of these two in the uppercase M between text and display of San Francisco, though I hadn't seen uh, back then. But it's number uh, four, lighter weight throughout, that I'd like you to focus on for a second. Last year I was working on a project for a very ambitious Italian software uh, startup. They wanted to improve their branding, and part of what I did for them was working with their designer consultant, Marcello Luppi, and come up with a new logo mark. Which was fine until I re realized that we realized that the lettering I had designed was doing strange things when reduced. The solution involved multiple adjustments in spacing and detailing, but the letters I want to specifically call out to you are the E, the B, and the S. Because of the way they are built, with two counters and three, um, three vertical bars, uh, sorry, horizontal bars, these required an overall lighter stroke thickness. I mean, look how much lighter the E is next to the O when blown up. This is for the smaller size. But when it's small, poof, you can't see it anymore. Another example of this weight relief in is in monospace type faces, especially in heavier weights. I actually use this, use this an, as an example uh, of density relief in my 2016 talk at WWDC. This is not the San Francisco talk, which you, I don't know, some people have seen. This is the, the one afterwards, the year afterwards. I made a, a talk that was meant to be complementary to the previous one from 2015, but apparently no one watched it, so hey, <laughs> check it out. <laughs> And lastly, I must mention that this kind of weight adjustments is actually far more common than you might think. In fact, it's so common that any typeface that includes a lowercase g with the binocular construction pretty much needs to adopt it. The bolder the weight, the lighter the g has to proportionally become if it wants to look the same weight than the rest of the letters. And this, of course, is weight, size, uh, design, and purpose dependent. You can also imagine how important these adjustments is in not dense non-Latin scripts, like CJK, for instance. Okay, so while working in San Francisco, I noticed that curves, especially the arches in N, M, H, and even the top of the lowercase a, had a tendency to collapse onto themselves when small. In other words, if this was my idealized skeleton, uh, poorly drawn with the pen tool in Keynote, bear with me, I noticed it, was, it looked like it was doing this when it was small. So there was an optical illusion whereby the round curves were collapsing back onto themselves when reduced. And this is even more subtle as an adjustment to San Francisco between text and display. But by making the counterforms of and the overall curve somewhat leaning rightwards, actually 
rightwards in the text, we retained the shape we wanted in the display and avoided the optical illusion in the smaller sizes. And similarly, we notice uh, this thing in the four, which looked like it was doing this at smaller sizes. Diagonal looked like it was collapsing onto the counter. And the solution, our solution was to introduce a slight outwards bow in the text fonts and de-emphasize it somewhat in the display ones, even though it was still there. And lastly, for the Creo project that I showed you earlier, Creo Labs, um, it also involved designing the icon for the app. The idea we eventually settled on was this C uh, for Creo, which also reminded us of a 3D cube, uh, a bit of a tribute to uh, the next logo by Paul Rand. Marcello Luppi, um, Creo's graphic designer, came up with the final shape, the colors, and the rounded corners treatment, which we all liked when it was big. But I noticed that the corners started to look fuzzy when small, and that the internal angle wasn't um, all that crisp. And so I set out to correct it, and decided to remove the roundness from the smaller sizes and emphasize the square gesture uh, for the smaller sizes. Like this. The result is an icon that I think feels the same big and small. Okay, so everybody's familiar with uh, Bell Centennial by Matthew Carter. And if you're not, go look it up because it's, it's a, a brilliant design. Another good one is Amplitude by Christian Schwartz. And again, check it out, it's great design. So I want to use these examples of ink traps. Instead, I'm going to use a design um, uh, from 2004 by my Italian colleague Fabrizio Schiavi. The design is called SIS, S-Y-S. This is SIS. It's the old school SIS, actually, in true type suitcase format, which not only prominently featured ink traps, was completely hand hinted too in 20, 2004. Fabrizio has since released the version uh, 2.0, which is a big update to SIS, uh, which you can find on his site on Typekit, and he has a broader character set and more weights. Not enough people are familiar with Fabrizio's work, and uh, I'd like to do my small part to change that, because I think it's brilliant. Now, obviously, ink traps, or lacuna, according to Hess, are the classic feature that works great when small and adds interest to shapes when large, right? Well, not so, fa not so fast. A design like SIS, uh, which is meant for small sizes in low-resolution screen, gets away with it because when rendered in pixels, the ink traps are simply no longer there. And he made them small enough that if you do end up printing SIS relatively small or show it in a high-resolution display, the ink will indeed feel um, those traps. But let me show you something else. This is a design by Simoncini called Delia. It's from the early 60s. It was used in the Italian Yellow Pages 10 years before Galfra by Ladislas Mandel, whom I, I mentioned in my introduction, uh, was ever designed. In fact, Galfra was initially designed to replace Delia for the Italian uh, Yellow Pages. Now, Delia has many interesting features. It's a really experimental design, including the stencil-like cuts that you see, which to me represent the extreme versions, uh, version of ink traps Simoncini uh, used them here, and he also in, uh, used them in a later design meant for newspapers by the name of Selene. This is like late 60s. Again, very interesting, very experimental stuff, and stuff that worked for the output technology that it was meant for. Simoncini also had another trick up his sleeve, though. You see these pointy bits uh, at the top of the strokes? These are part of a system that Simoncini patented in 1963 which we refer to as the Metodo Simoncini. It was part, it was a system, sorry, of working backwards from the desired results in print and preemptively distorting the drawings to achieve that result. Here you see what a letter would look like if it wasn't preemptively distorted. It's a forward-thinking idea for, for the time. Now, I have tried multiple times to reuse these techniques in my projects, and I'm going to embarrass myself like I was promising the students today as if I hadn't done enough already, and show you some drawings from my very first week, uh, well, probably second week in Reading. Uh, the first workshop with Herr Dunger. Please be kind. <laughs> I looked a lot different back then. <laughs> now, <laughs> lo looking backwards, the brief he gave us was hilariously prophetic. He said, design a typeface for reading on the iPhone. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> I figured, aha, I know what I'll do. I'll draw simple shapes with a huge X site, and then I'll ink trap the heck out of them. <laughs> so here you can see I'm starting to eat away into the corners. 
And here I've gone full on Simoncini. Excellent. <laughs> and, but it didn't stop there. I'm like, I'm gonna digitize my drawings and make it into a multiple master font. Yeah, there's no variable font in 2008. With two axes, and I'm gonna call them cuts and spikes. Here I crank the cuts. Here I crank the spikes. And here I turn everything up to 11 and combine it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I cannot overstate what an absolute failure of a project this was. <laughs> Later on, I tried again adding Simoncini details to other screen fonts, <laughs> but because the screens were high resolution screens with white type on pitch black background, anything weird around the outlines you can actually see. So no ink traps, no spikes, no cuts, no nothing. <laughs> so I'm not trying to say that we shouldn't keep studying or using ink traps. All I'm saying is that adjustments like these are highly specific to the output technology they are designed for. So be careful. Ink traps are like salt an everyday modification which you can add to any food to make it taste like something. Too much, and it will hurt your arteries, let alone your palate. But they are also like violence. Some confused people, when confronted with a difficult problem, think violence is the answer. And when it doesn't work, they think they just need to use more of it. <laughs> when actually dumping the violence and switching to a different plan is the better solution. I apologize about that. <laughs> okay, so let's see if we learn anything new here. We talked about micro adjustments to overshoots, weights, curves, shapes, and we talked about ink traps. I think it's easy to fall into the pitfall of thinking that just by applying a bunch of wacky adjustments, perhaps overdoing them, one immediately has a design. Here I mean a design in the sense of an original creative idea, like I was mentioning earlier. Um, an original piece of design, type design, I think is more than a bunch of ink traps slapped onto an otherwise boring skeleton. These adjustments cannot save ill-conceived or poorly executed shapes, uh, as my uh, Unger workshop uh, project clearly shows, uh, I hope. But that said, uh, as we've seen before, micro adjustments do require design methodology. At the very least, you identify an issue, you come up with a solution, you test the solution and validate the, your initial perception. But the solution can be also creative and non-intuitive, especially because adjustments are highly dependent um, on multiple factors, like scale, context, shape, technology, et cetera, which are all interlinked and nonlinear. So while it's certainly possible to make the computer do some of these for us automatically, well, the choice of which adjustment to apply to how much and to which design is entirely design choice. Now, I view as part of my job as a type designer and engineer to be aware of the subject of adjustments, but not being enslaved by it, to be simultaneously conscious of what my eyes think they are seeing and how to manipulate it, but also of what they cannot see yet to go further and to go beyond. And now, let me show you what I've been up to. <laughs> My upcoming type founder, the Fonderia Cavedoni. It's a project that I've been wanting to do for more than 10 years now, so I, can't, I cannot tell you how exciting it is. The Fonderia Cavedoni is a new label focused on new, original, allegedly, designs. <laughs> well, that's the hope. Given my background, uh, the Fonderia places a big emphasis on the union on form and function, but also on the union on research and practice. I'd like to the work we published to feel like it's been crafted by someone, but I would also like the founder to go beyond just type design and to work in the field of lettering at large, apply lettering, consultancy, and beyond. And lastly, what's the point of doing all this every day if it's no fun, you guys? So I slapped together a quick logo mark uh, last year, and of course I developed three optical sizes, <laughs> of course. So having said all that, let me show you uh, some recent work. The first one is a typeface that I'm working on right now, and you've seen it throughout this presentation. It will be the first release by the Fonderia later this year. Out of all the designs I've made in the past few years, it's the one that I feel the strongest about. And when I started the foundry, many people told me to start not with just with one design, but with three, at least three, so you could have a direction. And so here, you can see three related designs all in this family. This is the first. It's a straightforward kind of vanilla sans serif. And I'm building it up in weights. Obviously, I mean, it's not completely done, so you, if you see anything wrong, Jean-Francois, uh, let me know. <laughs> Mathieu, please. So that's the first. 
that's the second, and it's kind of related. It's, it has a, uh, it's the same family, slightly different flavors, so you can dial in exactly what you want. And it looks like this. It starts bringing into this humanist uh, uh, design, first of all, some ideas from different styles of calligraphy. In this case, I'm borrowing from rustic uh, Roman um, calligraphy. But also, it brings some sort of puffiness to the counter shapes, so they become square and some angularity overall. And again, it builds up in weight. Today, I'm just going to show you the uprights, uh, but of course, there's also italics. All right, and then Rambo. This is the second one, and this is the third one, which is slightly strange because it actually is a black letter. In fact, it, it borrows from the rotunda style of calligraphy. And there it is. So the designs are kind of like, they're, they're meant to be uh, from the same family, but they give you the, give you the designer um, uh, different, slightly different flavors to play with. Obviously, you can use them as optical sizes, but they're not transparent optical sizes. They are sort of uh, expressive optical sizes. But you can also use them separately as different kind of voices because they do have completely different feels to them. This is what they uh, look like kind of superimposed. You can actually see that there's some sort of a, a common skeleton to them. And I mean, I'm gonna show you some letters and it, what I want you to focus on is the fact that in some cases I am actually uh, removing some details like here, for instance, but I'm also adding it back depending on what I want the family to, to, uh, to do. So in the queue I'm adding actually a little detail, but I'm removing it here. This is just a preview, so I'll go fast. So you can't really see what you're, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you see here, like, you know, the details, they get progressively um, sort of uh, uh, removed. I, I remove the density. And in some cases, you can, you know, you can find creative solutions to like, it's the same shape, same character, but developed differently. I have a bunch of theories about numbers, which I won't go into detail today, but as you can see, there's things going on with the six and the nine, and the two and the three. It's exciting. <laughs> the zero needs a little dot in very small sizes, so I just added it. The two is confusable with the lower uppercase Z, so I added a little thing. And I just redesigned the three, because I thought it wasn't readable. So here's the first, here's the second, and here's the third. And no, they will not be called the first, second, and the third. There's actual <laughs> marketing name for all of these, but it's not quite ready yet. So, now for something completely different. This is a highly technological piece of technology, uh, sorry, piece of lettering that I did last year. Client comes along and says, I have a gate. I want to sign for it. But you need to, to put the family heraldry on there. And it gives me this sketch. It's like, I want the shape, and I want that to be, you know, I want that to be the text, and that to be the heraldry. And he says, hey, don't forget about the crown, because the person who did this part didn't put the crown on there, and it needs to be there. All right, okay. So I'm, you know, I'm here <laughs> doing lettering stuff, and the first thing I do is drawing lion uh, paws for, <laughs> for days and days, which I did, and, and as, clear, as you can tell, probably, I'm, I was learning how to draw actual lions at the point. And here I'm sort of fiddling with uh, kind of like the, the lettering and the composition to try to figure out how to make an actual object. This carryable thing is the actual first full-size um, mock-up that I did, which is actually useful uh, because then I could uh, use this highly technological technique of putting it on the wall and seeing actually that I had too much detail in the, uh, in the heraldry, which then I used the uh, uh, to the Toulouse technique of using um, uh, what's called a transparent paper to do this kind of layer, uh, you know, adjustments until I got to somewhere where I was happy. And then I could test it in, in a highly technological way with Photoshop by doing this sort of a rendering kind of a thing. But here I, I could actually tell, you know, that the, for instance, testing all the uppercase, all lowercase, try different proportions, and it's actually much faster to do it in here. 
Now, once I was happy, I made a final layout, sort of a tighter sketch. And now it was time to actually make something. So this is a piece of slate uh, that I got from a quarry. And here is me masoning the, uh, the corners. And this is, you can tell this is a fake shot because the dummy, which is the hammer, is actually <laughs> down there. Uh, I'm, I'm holding the phone to take the picture, otherwise, you know, <laughs> you guys, it's for science. <laughs> and the way I'm doing this, I mean, I could have used s um, uh, power tools, but then I wouldn't have a hand on which to hold this microphone today. So I decided to do it all by hand, which is more laborious, but it was uh, uh, an interesting process for me, which means I just drew a V-cut on one side and on the other, like that, until I was left with a corner in my hands. And I need to do it four times. Chisel out the, the border, and actually start making a chamfer so that this thing looks like an object instead of like a slab of stone with like some letters slapped on it. Once this is done, which takes kind of a, a bit of work, you transfer the design onto the stone with gra um, uh, wax paper or you know carbon copy paper or something, um, which looks like this, and you can't really see very m well, and so you actually have to paint. I mean, it's an I I it helps you to paint onto the stone, so you can actually see the letters, you know, uh, white on black. And then you realize at this point that actually the lines are too far apart and they're too close to the heraldry, so you have to erase everything and start over. You repaint the letters <laughs> for the second time, but this time you make sure you have actual second pair of eyes to help you with the with the layout. <laughs> you keep the corners so you can practice your heraldry with them. And these, these examples are all failures of heraldry. I tried, uh, sorry, uh, gilding. I tried uh, multiple times and I failed with all the different gold sizes and stuff until I found a recipe that actually worked, which meant I was ready for actual carving. Except it was winter, so I needed a heater. That, that thing is not a light. It's actually a little, yeah, heater. So then you start cutting until uh, you go on. You start from the bottom towards the top because otherwise you would smear the, the, the mm, painted letters. And eventually you get to something that looks like that. Once you're happy with it, you can actually wash the stone so it removes all the residue, let it sort of uh, uh, dry out in the sun. And then you, can, uh, you, you have to seal the places that you cut with shellac. Once you've done that, you're ready for the second part, which is the gilding. You can actually apply uh, gold size and then gold foil on top of the letters and use this highly technological equipment to make the, basically make sure the dust won't go where the, 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 the size is, which is, size is actually glue. So if um, dust goes on, on it, you have to remove it afterwards. So then you cover it, and the, the, the cups <laughs> hold. <laughs> Great technology, you guys. And here, um, I'm actually honing the stone um, as a final kind of step with water, so like I use it as lubrication with, with sandpaper. And you're left with, uh, really hard to photograph, um, kind of 3D shapes, finally. Now you have an object. It's been gilded and finished, but you're not done because you need to do the, the scary part, which is drilling onto the stone and hoping it won't completely destroy itself before you install these things, uh, which are uh, steel dowels, essentially threaded dowels. Um, and then you drill into the column where it's supposed to go, and all of a sudden, you're done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I like to do kind of this uh, before and after shots. Uh, they look like kind of like this hair uh, sort of growth thing for like elderly men like myself. We have the before and the guy looks like all sad and the afterwards where you have all the vegetation and everything. <laughs> so let me just do this for a second. <laughs> huh? So the stone, not only did it make the column look better, it also bring, brought back spring. <laughs> and the neighbors were really happy, the cows there. <laughs> All right. So <laughs> lastly, part of what I do is actual research. I'll keep this super brief um, uh, because my research actually interests are far too many uh, to go through here. Um, but letter cutting and the history of epigraphic letters are of course uh, of great interest to me. With Professor James Claff, who also taught uh, Ruggiero, we've been studying the history of development of the toponomastic plaques of the city of Milano, including a deep dive into the history of the Elsevier style of lettering, which is actually originated in France. 
I talked about Simon Chini uh, before. I did a talk last year at AIPI Antwerp about their work in September 2018. And the year before that, I co-curated with Elisabeth Bellato an exhibition about Simon Chini. The work there isn't done by any means. In fact, Elisa and I are in the process of uh, continuing the research to eventually publish a full-length book about uh, Simon Chini. And lastly, I've also been researching the history of the Nebbiolo type foundry. In 2012, I presented a type called Milwaukee on the typeface Stop by Aldo Novarese, which you may be familiar with. And I keep seeing everywhere. In fact, I actually try to take as many pictures of this thing as I possibly can. I have hundreds now. And recently, I joined the board of a research group for what we call the Nebbiolo History Project, which we also announced in Antwerp last year, and I hope we'll have some news about that soon. So with that, thank you very much. One second. Almost done. Now before <laughs> Q&A, I just want to show some credits for the pictures. Uh, all the images in this talk are my own, but I would like to thank the San Francisco Public Library and its librarian Andrea Grimes for the beautiful images of the Cadiz Trajan Fortage and for allowing me to use them. And uh, some further reading, just really quick. If you're interested in the subject of legibility and how to design for it, Sophie Bayer has published two relevant books which you should check out. The first is called Reading Letters. Uh, it's a bit of an overview on the state of the current scientific research on legibility. And the second, more recent one, is called Type Tricks. It's a little pocket guide uh, to many interesting topics like the ones uh, of, just of adjustments that I showed you earlier. Now, you won't see the exact examples that I mentioned in Sophie's book, but there are plenty of other interesting ones. Uh, both books are published by BIS Publishers. And I've already men mentioned Tim and Shoko's book, but I figure I'd give it the bibliographic details as well. Apart from being an excellent piece of work, it's also a great example of self-publishing, I think. You can get this, the second improved edition of the book exclusively from Tim and Shoko's site, justanotherfoundry.com, which also helps support the authors. Now, if you have any feedback whatsoever on this talk, bad or good, now or in the future, for those who, of you who are watching this video, I'd be eternally grateful if you did reach out and actually let me know, because it helps me tremendously, and I thank you for it. Now, <laughs> go. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you very much, Antonio. Let's start with the questions. Sure. The first one is, I know that at the beginning of your career, and still nowadays, you are a programmer. I yeah. mean, you joined Apple as an engineer. Yeah. Uh, so basically, you used to work on a digital environment, more yeah. or less. But today, during your talk, we were able to see how strong and important is the influence of your end on your letters. Here's 50 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how important are these two different approaches yeah. to you? The analog and the digital one? <laughs> and uh, which is your project when you approach Sorry, which is your process when you approach a uh, new project? How do you balance the two of them? I, is there someone who is like more stronger than the other or it depends on the you project? You engineering and, and design? No, the, yeah, yeah, exactly. The digital part and the um, yeah, analog so one. Uh, I mean, I started my uh, career as a web designer when I was actually 18, b after I came to Paris to see Jean-Francois uh, Parisian stuff. And uh, so yeah, I mean, I've always worked with a computer and on the screen. Um, I have never actually considered kind of coding or uh, engineering matters separate from design for myself. Um, I al I've always been a tinkerer, so I liked how to figure out how things worked, uh, and I, I would code. I mean, I would open them up and see how they were put together. So um, that said, as you probably saw, I mean, I'm trying to do most uh, analogical work nowadays. I'm forcing myself to because there's an actual richness to it. I mean, thinking with your hands and not just with your brain and you know, computer is actually brings out different things. And uh, I don't have any art background. I, in fact, I don't have any design background. I studied communications, uh, apart from type design, which was just one year. And so I'm teaching myself how to code. I'm teaching myself how to draw, as you saw with the, with the lion thing. Um, and uh, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's like, I feel like the more I do it, the, m the, the, the better the outcomes become, and it's always a process like of growing. Um, if I don't see growth in what I'm trying to do in the next project, I, I'm not super motivated by it, essentially. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Second one. Yeah. Um, you showed uh, San Francisco, your yeah. one of your biggest projects. 
that was specifically designed for two devices, yeah. the iPhone and the Apple Watch. How much the devices influenced the leather shapes and which different uh, there are in the two designs? Okay, so with these designs, we actually tried to not focus too much on what the pixels were doing and what the screens were doing, because we knew that the screens were gonna change, right? So the iPhone, the Apple Watch, they have a certain screen, but every year, Apple comes up with something that is better. And so if we stuck to this one specific resolution, we knew already that it was gonna be obsolete. And so what I tried to do um, was actually bringing the, th the things that people were doing in typography for centuries, which is optical sizes and adjustments to tracking, into the digital world. Now, I mean, it's a tiny contribution, <laughs> but that's what I thought was, would, would help. And, and I think it did because San Francisco, you know, survived uh, th th these kind of screens. Uh, and in fact, it's been applied to like branding, you know, billboards and, and everywhere else. So it kind of holds up despite the technology um, that, that is used for. So yeah, I wouldn't say, you know, the technology didn't influence actually very much. It was mostly like what we wanted to say from a design point of view. So Great. Next question. Hello. Uh, I got... Uh, many questions, but I think I will have to stick to one, which I think can also interest you, and it's you are going to start your own foundry, and yep. piracy in type design is, is a thing. Yep. Uh, obviously, there are more tools now and, and thing. and in our studio, we're, we're planning to release some typefaces, but we're always aware about what's going to happen with them, and we had like one month about investigating how to Try to stop like not being able to download from our type from our from our web page, uh -huh. and not being able to download our fonts because mm -hmm. if you know what everything that's posted on a web page, it can be downloaded. Yeah. Okay. So I, I, I you are a programmer, you know this. So okay, we found that the best way to stop piracy in, in web page design was to put like uh, many layers of complications. Okay. Okay. So my question is, how are you planning to fight? Uh, not downloading. I, I have like uh, here the document that we did about mm. how to stop piracing and, and this, yeah. but I'm interested on how are you planning to, to do that, yeah. yeah, to stop the piracy. So, violence, right? Well, yeah, violence uh, always works, so ink traps everywhere. No, um, <laughs> well, um, I mean, ultimately, <laughs> we, can't do, we can't do much about piracy because if people want to really steal what we do as designers, it's yeah. the same as with people who make movies and the people who make music. You know, uh, ultimately, I think society needs to change yeah. to understand that if people uh, steal what I do, then I'm not going to eat, which means I'm not going to make any more of that. And so, I mean, it's kind of strange because people who steal your work usually like it. So they actually yes. kind of so want to support you. But in some cases, there are people that want to support you, but they can't because you know, maybe they're students or like, they don't have the means. And I think that kind of piracy, I'm not saying it's right, <laughs> but I'm saying it's from a, from a creative perspective, it's more you know, easy to kind of get along with. Because I'm like, if you can't afford it, you know, I'm not saying go steal the stuff that I make or anybody yeah, else yeah. makes. Um, but yeah, the people who do uh, can't afford it and do steal your stuff, uh, I mean, technically there's nothing we can do. It's sort of like when I, when I was making web pages, okay, which was my first job, web pages come with source code. So anybody could steal whatever you do. So that's been kind of the story of my life. And so I'm kind of, I think I'm at ease with it. You know, I'm cool with people looking at the source and seeing what's going on. And, you know, uh, what I'm hoping is that the stuff I make is interesting enough and people are like, okay, we want more of this. That they'll actually go ahead and, and patronize the foundry, meaning that they'll, they'll pay for the stuff we do. Uh, but yeah, let's hear, you know, your, uh, your techniques later on. And uh, uh, sure. So, but at the moment you haven't think much about it, right? Well, the thing is, if you, if you do things like DRM, for instance, Apple used to do that in, uh, in um, iTunes, remember that, and Steve Jobs wrote an article about it, yeah. about why they removed it. The thing there was, I'm not speaking about, you know, for Apple, because I wasn't even there when this happened. I'm just, what I read on the, on the papers. But the thing is, that ended up uh, hurting more <laughs> the people who are actually paying. Yeah. So uh, whatever you do, you don't want to inconvenience your actual users, your customers. These are the people who supported you and they paid for your making this stuff. So if you find a way to make things safe without you know, uh, hurting the people who are actually supporting you, then sure. I think it's a bit of a kind of a slippery slope. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm thinking more about making good stuff 
which is something I can control. Piracy, I cannot control. Okay. So, you know, I, I, I'll think about it, but it's like, you know, proportionally, it's not the biggest, uh, the biggest okay. thought. Okay. Thank you. There's one there. <laughs> Thank you for your talk and showing us your amazing work. Uh, yeah. yeah, you should. You said that you had a lot of theories about numbers. Yeah, and I it do. sounded like a teaser to me. <laughs> uh, Although I know it's like a deep, big topic. Can you briefly mention at least one of them? At least one one of the topics. Uh, one one theory about numbers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, uh, six and the nines in here. I can actually show you the slide. If I can find it. Uh, one second. One second. Here. So. Now, um, so I, I, um, obviously the first, when I was working at Apple, the first project that we published was uh, for the Apple Watch. So you can imagine that numbers were kind of important for that project. So I ended up studying them quite deeply and actually realizing that there isn't uh, a lot written about them, which meant that I actually had to do my own research. I'm still doing it. It's kind of a longer term project. That's why I'm kind of teasing it because it's not ready for any consumption whatsoever. However, I have noticed recently that um, some people, when they write with their hands, they actually don't do the same shape for the six and the nine, for instance. They always start the six with one stroke, and they make the nine with a little tail. I don't know why th this, I found this in Italy, I found it in France, I found it in Thailand when I went on vacation this, uh, you know, uh, a couple years ago. And, uh, and so I started realizing, hey, wait a minute, the six and the nine actually didn't develop from the same shape, kind of mirrored, but they developed, they have completely different historical background. And so in this typeface, I decided, okay, I'm gonna acknowledge that, and I'm gonna actually make different shapes, which they kind of look weird when you see them like this, which is nev you never see typefaces like this used, of course. You people don't type all the numbers out. When you use them in text, uh, what I found surprising was that you couldn't actually tell. You couldn't tell that they had different constructions because people don't really care about these kind of things. And in text, they kind of just look fine. It does actually do help, though, in smaller sizes because now the six is not recognizable or, or mistakable for a G. Which is, if you use the other construction, imagine the six, the nine was rotated, and you imagine a lowercase, an uppercase G, right? You can imagine that they actually are pretty much the same shape. So with that six, I'm completely avoiding the problem. So that's one. Uh, there's multiple other theories, but then I'll give you out all my secrets. No, I'm just yeah. kidding. Cool. But it, it's yeah, it's longer talk that I want to eventually give, and uh, I think when this type of will get released, there'll be something about the numbers because these are the beginning of something. I think. So. Thank you. You're welcome. Jean -Francois. Um, in the 90s, most of the study um, um, was used by type designer about legibility to yep. have open counters yep. like this typeface. Yep. Yes. And um, at the time, um, at Apple, the, the typeface was in use was Lucida. Uh-huh. Okay. For for the interface, it was the typeface they used because it was open. Yep. Uh, because Charles Bigelow was working uh, with or for Apple for many years. Yep. So all the story of about humanistic open uh, differentiation of shape to make the typeface more legible in certain size with certain resolution was lower than today. Yep. And. Um, uh, in the same time, when um, when the iPhone was out, yep. suddenly there is this big uh, comeback of Helvetica, especially the thin uh, weights. Yep. So at Apple for interface, they have they begin to use Helvetica a lot. They even switch to Helvetica for even for macOS. Yep. But for the communication, they use uh, Adobe font Myriad. 
like an open design humanist. Yeah, open design humanist on yep. for the packaging, for yep. the shop, and like that. Uh, even for the, the 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 identity of Apple was using yep. uh, Adobe fonts to have the identity. So you have all this background of you know the study to make the thing more open yep. because of the design have to be also more accessible to people. Yep. All this kind of theory to make more human, more human friendly the design. Uh -huh. But in same time, you have this kind of trend of you know close counters, not yep. legible, but more trendy. I don't know exactly why Helvetica is there mm -hmm. at Apple at, at this moment. My question is long because it's difficult to <laughs> explain and to find solution and to find answer to that. Yep. So suddenly, even in your design, I have the same. You have the same path because. Yep. You're working on the Apple San Francisco yep. in one side, which is more close to Helvetica. Yep. Conceptually, more than uh, the design is very different. It's grotesque, yeah. Yes, but in your in your past, wha everything you have shown, even your study about legibility on mm -hmm. the open counters, differentiation of shape, is not at all on San Francisco, not not at this at this level. Mm -hmm. So, how you can explain that this this you know these two sides of we have to be open on, on humanly accessible. Yep. And then you have something you have to be, you know, on the trend. So, I mean, uh, the thing Sorry is... Sorry for the long question. It's okay. Um, <laughs> the thing is... Um, so the, last, uh, the last part, it's oh, you end up to do that typeface with this characteristic and not something more open, like at Microsoft or at Google. Most of their phones are m much more open following this path from the yeah. 90s. Uh, so, I mean, obviously, when you're looking, when you're working on a platform like the iPhone or the Mac, you're working with a platform that has been out there for a long time. So, changing the look of something is always a big problem. Now, San Francisco, uh, for the um, especially the version for uh, the iPhone, was actually. Uh, because at the time, in design sort of blogs and stuff, everybody was saying, hey, Helvetica doesn't work for small sizes. Helvetica is a, is a, is a disaster, blah, blah, blah. Actually, and part of what I was studying was the fact that um, the way Helvetica had been used, yeah, sure, it was a problem. But grotesque shapes can work. You can make anything work at small sizes, you know, as long as you adjust it correctly. And I think San Francisco kind of proves that, I personally think. Because San Francisco, what it did is, by doing the optical sizes, we could actually open the counter shapes. And if you use San Francisco really small, you'll actually see that it looks more like a humanist design in the sense that because the counters, the, the, the closed loops, they become taller and taller, eventually the counters become really big and really open. I kind of talked about this in a bit, uh, a bit in the first San Francisco talk. Uh, and so uh, part of what I think we were trying to do was like, okay, look, um, uh, uh, Helvetica and grotesques are kind of, People think that they cannot work, but actually, why? You know, who says? Uh, yeah, it's true. If you start with design like Myriad or or like Lucid or something, that structure gives you already kind of a um, a more open platform from which to start. But it has a voice, and I didn't choose the voice that we decided to to eventually use. But that's not the voice that we wanted for this one project. And so, I mean, I think San Francisco kind of hopefully showed that actually with adjustments like I showed you today, you can probably make anything work as long as you know what to do when, um, how to apply it. And uh, I mean, the fact that when it was released, no one kind of noticed, <laughs> apart from like, you know us nerds, I think kind of speaks to the fact that San Francisco did kind of achieve the goal of like, okay, it's, it looks kind of, it feels the same, but it's more legible. It's like, I, I suddenly I can see better what I'm doing. Uh, you know, try to see sh screenshots before San Francisco and afterwards, and I think, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll see that. Um, it's not up to me, you know, of course, to judge its success. Uh, all I can tell you is, like, why that, that was. Um, but, yeah, I mean, obviously, humanist shapes, you know, they do help. And calligraphy and all that, uh, you know, it all goes back to, like, what I was saying before, doing things with your hands, things that go back to crafted things. That's all part of Apple's sort of uh, uh, philosophy. Um, but that's not what we want to do for that project. So, so if we uh, have, um, we, s we start to have a conclusion to uh, your theory about that, it yeah. means that since many years, when uh, in school, people uh, we we we, we we say to people that 
In the 50s, it was like sans serif are less legible than serif. Exactly. And then after, we say that the Dido is less legible than um, yeah. Garamond. Yeah, something and then humanist like that. is, less le is more legible than grotesque. I'm yeah, like, Martin Mayer saying some theories about that in the 90s. That's fine. And he say, okay, Helvetica and all these um, mm -hmm. very close form doesn't work. But in fact, what are you seeing that you separate the legibility on technical problem of make the typeface legible from the style. Yes. So any shape, it can be Dido very I legible mean, in small. Within it reason. It can be an Helvetica very, s very legible in small. Helvetica, the style of. Yeah. And so uh, it separates uh, it separate things. Yeah, separate the style from the function. Yes. You know, and yes, then yes. And then, uh, it's interesting. So, yeah. One more? Some more? Okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so I will make the same question I said to, to the last TB, TB talks, yep. which is some of us are basing our uh, designs from typeries in very early 19th century specimens. Yep. Okay, so at that, but that time, uh, open type features didn't exist. Yep. So my question is, what are your thoughts on type designers who are trying to hide uh, type design decisions under uh, open type features. Do you know what they mean? Yeah, yeah. So you ma they make yeah. alternates because they don't want to decide. Yeah. I, I uh, think that's it. Yeah. So I mean, that's um, that's a strategy. I'm not going to say that it's bad or good. Uh, I prefer when designers actually do the work job of the designer, which is make decisions for. I wouldn't say like on behalf of other people, but they kind of remove choice away. And I'm not saying in the sense of like, you know, removing diversity, but removing, you know, if you want to use a computer, you just want to use a computer. You don't want to go mess, oh yeah, the six needs to be more like that, or like, you know, it's like a, in a variable fonts are great. Yeah, sure, except now I'm going to give everybody a slider as to, to figure out where is bold. And now my dad, they start to make like, you know, some newsletter, and he's like, okay, so where is bold? Uh, oh, it's like, you know, also he has to think about things that are like beyond what he wants to do at that specific time. So I think, you know, as designers, of course, you can give option and present it in a way that is digestible. Um, San Francisco tries to kind of, you know, make decisions for you and kind of apply them on your behalf, I think. Um, either strategy is fine. It depends on the context. It depends on what you want to do. Some designs are like uh, Swiss um, army knives, and they need to have all the different voices because they want to cover all of ground. Okay. That's fine. I probably end up, you know, this actual design tries to do some of that in, in a different way. Um, but yeah, not all design needs to do that. So it's entirely up to the specific project. I'm sorry, it's uh, sounds like a non-answer, but that's what I actually uh, feel. It's <laughs> fine. I just wanted to see your yeah, opinion sure. on this. Uh, thank you. Someone else? No? Anymore? We're ready for pizza. It seems. All right. Let's do it. So two great talks, <laughs> one really emotional and colorful, another one really practical and uh, useful. You literally couldn't ask for more. So it's time for pizza. Enjoy and uh, have a good evening. <laughs>